Hi friends, this is Trish and welcome to Teacher Therapy. Today we have a very special guest. He is a teacher insider, but we are going to let him introduce himself and just, Mr. Peterson, tell us a little bit about yourself. What got you into teaching? Where, what state are you in? Just whatever you want to tell us about your teaching background. I've been teaching for about 15 years and many ways I've been looking for my exit strategy and uh, qu hoping to quit for about 14 of those years. <laughs> if you guys catch my drift, uh, it, it, it occurred to me pretty quickly, uh, the shock that I received when I first started teaching that it wasn't what I was planning on uh, going through for the rest of my career. And I have kind of a, a secret fantasy of my own to have a YouTube channel like yours the very day that I end up finally exiting uh, this career because I, I, will, I want to unleash just an avalanche of all the stuff that I've gone through. And every teacher knows when you're in these faculty meetings, there's always that one, that one older teacher, you know, a man or a woman, a year or two away from retirement, they're just old and bitter and close to retired. And absolutely 100% fed up with all of the hog vomit that comes out of an administrator's mouth. And I, I yearn to be that person now, which is kind of, <laughs> it's kind of a sad thing, but uh, and in many, many ways, I'm already there. Like I, I'm, I'm already the teacher sitting in the faculty meeting, continually raising his hand and saying, you know what, uh, I, I got to raise an issue about this and so on. I'm, I don't have quite the the bitter sharp edge that the, the, the bitter old man has, but I'm close. So and if I may ask, what, what got you interested in teaching? What about teaching made you think, you know what, I want to go to college for this. I want to make this my lifetime career. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I'll have to suspend my subject until later on, which is, it, it does make a difference, but we'll, we'll go ahead and use science, but you guys will just have to trust me that when I say in my particular subject, when you can get a student to, um, to grasp the content matter, it's, it's a magical experience. So there, I even knew when I was in middle school and high school that, that I, that I enjoyed this subject so much that I, I really wanted to teach it. And I wanted to be a part of that symbiotic experience between the, the teacher and the student and and it's also quite a team effort so not only do you have this magical moment where a student understands the content matter and then you can actually do it with several people at once and you can create amazing stuff and I still even teach privately this the same the same content it, it is rewarding you know when I when I'm teaching privately out of the home but the best way to say it is the magic is simply gone in school. There's it's and it's not coming back. It's 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 gone. <laughs> yeah, I completely understand where you're coming from. So most of us, whenever we go to college, we get really excited. We believe that we're going to fulfill our dreams of, you know, helping to mold the youth of America. Mm -hmm. what Day was the biggest shock or surprise you got as soon as you actually started teaching students? The big, the day that I got the biggest shock, is that what you said? Or just like what surprised you about becoming an actual teacher versus the whole education process of becoming a teacher? Well, I, I guess I would say it's been a slow drip of disappointments. Um, if I can start with the most recent, it would be the across the board, out of control, disrespect and defiance on campus from the students. And then compounding that problem is the, the lack of support and follow through from administration, particularly the gaslighting and the manipulative tactics that they use, which I wouldn't have picked up on until recently, because when you're a new teacher, you're just, you're so nervous about screwing anything up that you're, even though you have kind of an intuitive knowledge that it's complete nonsense what you're being told, you, you want to comply because not only are they holding the hammer of that probationary period over your head, but you just you know, you're just trying to survive the year and you know that that you're in this bizarre nightmare world of children you know punking you in your classroom and on campus and that it's, it's just totally it's totally bizarre that's the way i would describe it you know it's totally unnatural and so in my first couple of years of teaching and 15 years ago it wasn't this bad but it was bad enough where you know that that this is not the way to to, to have a functional ordered environment in the classroom and the administration either addresses it in an ineffective way or just outright ignores it entirely or they drag it on for so many months that it doesn't matter when it finally does get addressed. And so that was kind of a slow drip that 
that went for a number of years. And then you try, I'm, I'm assuming other teachers have tried what I try, say, well, I'm going to go to a different grade level or a different age, you know, and see what happens there. And maybe for a couple months, it seems like you've, you've got a fresh start and you're in kind of a new world that you can control. And then inevitably, the same problems will exist, at least even if only in a different form. But I would say at least in the last couple of years, and I know a lot of people use the whole COVID, you know, the, the whole COVID experiment as, as an excuse, but it, it wouldn't have mattered if we had COVID or not, you know, the whole remote learning and all that stuff. It's just, it, this was, this is a trend that is spiraling downward, you know, rapidly and um, an, uh, just an unbelievable amount of d d defiance and disrespect, distractions, disruptions uh, in the classroom. And, you know, there's, there's a whole long list of issues that the more you, the more you introduce into it, it just, it's, it turns into a fire when it comes to the lack of support and follow through through admin and all of the disciplinary deficiencies. Elimination of consequences is a gigantic piece of that puzzle. Uh, parents being either disengaged or just outright combative with you, that's something that's gotten worse. I don't know if this is, this is something I noticed when I was a kid. So I was in elementary school. And sorry, everyone, I'm going to be going in all kinds of different directions here. I mean, this the, the amount of just like crazy stuff that you got to juggle every day, all year. I mean, there's, there's so many different directions you can take this in. So forgive me in a, ahead of time for being in so many different directions but if i could go into another story just for example so i'm a kid and i, I just got done with sixth grade i go into middle school and the first thing i noticed when i stepped on a middle school campus was how much foul language there was from everybody teachers and students and i thought like okay in elementary school you got you know, you got sent to the principal's office and that was a bad day for you if you said a bad word. And I'm not some prude, you know, I mean, like, I'm I'm a, I'm a lot like other adults. I temper my language when I'm in school and it changes when I'm not at, when I'm not in school. But you know, I remember going, whoa, like my first day of middle school, like, oh, okay, that's how everyone talks apparently. And that was ah, 30 years ago. So now I'm, I'm walking around on, you know, this high school campus and going, it's unbelievable amount of foul and dishonor language from students and for those you know for those followers of Christ out there you know from the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks and you are just walking around swimming in a soup of just dishonorable foul tongue everywhere it's it is really disappointing and just all around demoral demoralizing so like you know there's that problem that's coming up and that that's all being that's all from contributions I would guess mostly social media and the um, the lack of oversight probably at home or maybe even what they're picking up at home. I don't know. And I don't care. <laughs> you know, like whatever they're, whatever they're being influenced by, it is really bad. Today. Then you also have the just, you know, when it comes to discipline matters, the straight up just infantilization of students. And they even do it to the faculty too in meetings. Like the, the, the stuff that we're sitting through is, I mean, I'm, a, you know, I'm at a high school and it really really feels like you're just in a third grade class with what they're talking about. Like, and I would love to get into that later, but continuing on, um, you got faculty and administration turnover, which we could get into that too. The dramatic drop of quality of attention and aptitude and engagement in the student body. This uh, very unhealthy obsession with making learning quote unquote fun. And I, I really like what you talked about before about how, you know, like, you know, we'll, Okay, chocolate cake it tastes great and all we gotta do is make broccoli taste like chocolate cake and everyone's gonna eat broccoli and like that's pretty much my response whenever they try to tell us well what, how are you making learning fun I say well let's talk about how to make broccoli taste like chocolate cake and when we pull that off then we'll start entertaining the discussion about how I'm making learning fun in the classroom because learning is supposed to be its own reward on its own merit and it, what becomes fun is when you know how to do it and then you can do it on your own and then you can use that to you know branch out and be creative in whatever direction you want to take stop me if i'm going too long <laughs> another big yeah, problem I'll just, gonna, I'll just kind of pause and summarize what i've heard you say so far so it sounds like you were really passionate about being a teacher and once you got into the classroom you just realized how much culturally things have changed just with the outrageous language cursing defiance 
disrespectful kids that won't work, parents that won't support, and an admin that won't support. And um, now you were just kind of talking about how with the actual, the school districts and the expectations, we're essentially expected to make everything outrageously fun, yet pretty much create Yale and Stanford graduates. Sure. <laughs> high school. And yeah, I totally agree with you because I think the fundamental difference that I've noticed between now and when I was in school was that there was just an understanding that you're going to have to work. You're not going to like all your teachers. You're not going to like all your subjects, but the responsibility was on the student to actually be the one to do the hard work. So, I mean, I can think of teachers that I had a math teacher in particular, he was a terrible teacher. And I, I didn't get a pass for not learning the content though. So I literally had to go home, take my textbook and teach it to myself from the textbook. Now these days, we literally have kids that have every tutorial and teaching aid imaginable mm -hmm. for free on YouTube. <laughs> Yet somehow it's like they want to come, make no effort, not try at all, have a horrible attitude and then try to constantly blame the teacher. Well, I don't like the teacher. He's mean. This class isn't fun. You know, just and it and the crazy the the shocking part is everybody seems to accept that right the admin yeah. accepts it and they're like well you know how are how are you making it fun how are you doing all of these things and so were there was there any kind of time period where you felt like you sort of lost hope with where things were going in education did it take a little bit of time a lot of bit of time how did that work I, I suppose if I had to put a year on it it probably would have been around maybe 2014 or 15 and I'm taking a guess at that. That's when I started noticing these major issues. I'm just going to name a couple of them. One gigantic issue is just simply the blurring of the lines between student and teacher. And they, they are very much for trying to turn it into a partnership where you're on the same level as the student and they can approach you and speak to you as if they're the, you're their friend outside on the basketball court. And there must be a separation in authority there where... You know, that's the essence of the educational model is the reason normally why a student would enroll in a class is that they're telling themselves, okay, I don't know this information. And this person at the front of the room does know this information. And that's what makes the time valuable. Like that's it. So when I enroll in a class, I'm going in there with the assumption that this person knows it and I need to listen to it. And unless there's some kind of circumstance otherwise where the teacher is obviously not doing what they're supposed to be doing, then that's when, you know, that's when administration can be involved and things can be addressed and yada, yada, yada. But now they're trying to make it where you're just a friend of the, of the student and you're all just kind of hanging out together. And that is a very big problem. So that's, that's one major issue is this idea of this liberal idea of partnering with the students instead of actually being in charge and giving them an ordered and structured environment where things are, where communication is exchanged in a professional manner and yet blah, raising your hand, waiting your turn, yada, yada. So the yeah. second, yeah, the second major problem is simply disciplinary deficiency and unwillingness really to penalize students who are not obeying really kind of, you know, timeless, universally recognized standards of, you know, professionalism or just straight up policy, you know, policy that's been tried and true since the beginning of, since the beginning of time, you know, in every facet of life, all of the policies that would be boilerplate, ordinary, normal things that we all recognize in a classroom exist in sports, they exist in law, they exist in business, they exist in family, they exist in, you know, military, everything, everything you could name. We all have this really reliable standard of how communication is exchanged an understanding between an authority figure and someone who's learning or whatever. So, and uh, there is there is a deliberate unwillingness to penalize um, misbehavior, defiance, disrespect, uh, even coming down to th simple things like showing up on time, being there at all. <laughs> like, like it's it's insane. So that is that's what I would call the two biggest major issues going on. Definitely. Yeah, that kind of reminds me back when I was going through teaching professional developments. They contrasted the. The sage on stage versus the guide on the side. <laughs> They're like, you guys need to be the guide on the side. We're not doing the sage on stage anymore. And oh, barf. <laughs> yeah. 
luckily, because it was just, everything was just supposed to be like this communal kind of learning experience. But the irony is, to me, it looked like the students were supposed to basically do like no kind of work. So like, you know, if you saw a video from maybe, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, you might see students in a quiet classroom actually doing work. But it's like, if an administrator walked in, in that kind of environment, they would think that you were the worst teacher on the planet. They would be like, mm. well, why aren't we collaborating? Why aren't we in small groups? Why aren't we discussing? You know, why are we not doing student driven learning was like another big buzzword. And it just it's at that point, what's the point of school? <laughs> like, why yeah. do you hire a teacher if you want them to be a guide on the side that, you know, coincidentally, nobody listens to the guide <laughs> on the side, you know, and I'm totally with you on that 100%. Let's talk a little bit more about parents, because I know that a lot of teachers have expressed the frustration that the older the students get, the more hands off the parenting gets. And a lot of times at that point, sometimes they don't even know what to do with their kids anymore. So what mm -hmm. has been your experience with like trying to deal with parents in relation to struggling or misbehaving students? Both extremes so you just like you mentioned you have the parents that are really hands-off and they basically say well you know my kids with you so you deal with their kind of thing and you, I mean, you can only imagine what kind of nightmare that could turn into <laughs> you know just trying to get anything done or anything through to, a, through to a kid or trying to get any kind of support from the administration and th I mean if they try to get in touch with the parent they'll have the same result as I do so there's that problem and then you have the other problem where basically a parent's turning their child into a, a little activist and so so uh, I'll have a student in class who's constantly talking, constantly disrupting. You know, I keep marking them down and then they'll they'll go back to their parents and say, well, you know, Peterson's just, you know, picking on me. You know, he's he's discriminating against me. And so now you're in the office and he says, you know, Peterson was retaliating and discriminating. You got a kid that can't articulate anything valuable in class and suddenly they're a lawyer, you know, in, in the office. And I'm like, it's that's. Yeah, you're either dealing with a parent who's um, who's absent or one that's coaching their child to be, you know, a little activist on a school campus and their kid, you know, has a problem like, um, you know, can't show up on time or you know, isn't showing up at all or can't do long division, but suddenly they're a genius in the office. So absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So what would you... I want to kind of help somebody out that has not been a teacher before. I want you to kind of walk me through your feelings when you're like walking into the building, you're setting up for class, and then kind of walk us through just the kind of feelings that you experience as you're trying to teach. What are some of like on an average day, some of the issues that you would encounter in the classroom? <laughs> okay. Um, I would describe my feelings as 1000% completely resigned. So from the moment I leave my house into the car, the entire drive there, uh, when I get to class and I'm setting up and it's all just routine, doing as bare little as possible not to get fired. If I could say this, I think teachers will understand what I mean when I say this. I, I am now, I'm not the kind of teacher who's trying to quote unquote make a difference in people's lives anymore. I, I I go to school. I mean, I am I'm happier than a clam if I can go through the entire year with 300 some odd students and know maybe four or five of their names at the end of the year. Like that is that's how done I am. Ironically, I actually have become one of the most popular teachers on class. And I don't know how I did it because, you know, it's like it's pretty clear. I don't want to be there. I know they don't want to be there. And I'm very down to business, straightforward. We're getting this done. You know, when I taught at elementary school, it was the same way. And for some crazy reason, I was so popular that parents would actually switch their students you know, primary teacher, just so that they would come, their students would come visit me, you know, during my class and stuff. And so, um, sorry, go yeah, ahead. I have a little bit of a theory. Like, I wonder if it has anything to do with you being a male teacher. Do you have a lot of male teachers in your building? No. Okay. No. I really think, I mean, I feel like a lot of us women teacher, because it's predominantly a women, woman field, feel kind of jealous of the guys because it just seems like they have a different dynamic with the students. And I think students are so craving for like father figures that I just think that guy teachers have a huge advantage. Would you agree or disagree? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't think about it much, but that does make a lot of sense. Yeah. And there's uh, a national authority that comes 
with a male presence that females don't have. So I feel like, you know, girl students would want to behave more, but the guy students might have a bit more initial respect for a male authority figure than a female one. Have you had that experience at all? Probably like uh, just this year, you know, my my administration is trying to do the whole backdoor soft hand kumbaya, you know, routine nonsense with the students. And the, the stu every student on campus knows this and they know that it's none of none of them respect the administration at all. And they, they tried that same, you know, the students tried the same manipulative tricks in my class and they learned very quickly that, you know, any challenge, any challenge to my authority will be met with um, basically, I'll make an example of you in class. I'll reduce you to a public mockery if you decide to do something like that to me and oh man how do i say this without giving away my subject dang it it's so oh <laughs> man it's, it's such a good story too but okay i'm gonna i'll try so um Okay, so let's let's say I'm a science teacher and a student tries to a student tries to challenge my authority in some way, then I'll I'll literally in class I will literally hand them the microscope and bring them up to the front of the room and I say, Okay, you go for it, teacher. And they're like, Oh, you know, they make it a big joke and everyone's laughing for 10, 15 seconds, and I'll just sit at my desk and I'll watch them. And they try to make a couple more jokes. And what a lot of people don't realize is the attention span of children is so small that you know, even if someone's a joker the rest of the class will be entertained for about 30 seconds and then even they will get bored with the joker so then the joker tries to you know tries to horse around for another couple seconds and they start feeling the pressure of everyone in the room watching them and that's an uncomfortable feeling you know if you don't have so if you don't have a plan in mind on how to move things forward so after about 30 seconds or so they look at me and they're like okay i'm done i'm like oh yeah dad you still got another 37 minutes to go let's see it let's see it champ <laughs> you know and they're like no i don't want to do this anymore i said too late Hey, you want to be the teacher, you're the teacher now. And so I'll let them sit there and sweat for another minute or two, you know, and really feel that pressure. And then the, most of the time they get the point and they'll sit back down. And this is just one example. Now, when it comes to my subject, let me just assure all of you guys, there is not a chance that anyone is going to stand up in the front of the room and do what I do. There's just no possible chance. And this usually follows a conversation with them after class where I say, look, I want you to explain to me what authority means. What's the, what does it mean to be the authority? And they usually respond with something like, well, it means you're in charge. And I say, well, that's true too. But the word authority actually stems from the word author, as in I'm the one who writes the lessons. I'm the one who writes the rules. I'm the one who writes the procedures and so on and so on. And when you are able to author yourself lessons and the rules and the procedures and all that, and if you can produce the same results or better than I can in this class, then I will officially hand over authorization to you. You will become the teacher and you can walk in whenever you feel like. You can tell the students they can act however they feel like. Whatever you want to do, you're in charge now. And I said, you just got a little taste of that when you were up in front of the room. And if you can't do that, on your own, then I would highly recommend that you sit in your seat and you don't talk while I'm talking and you don't disrupt my class. And 95% of the time it works. And then you get some, you know, nervous administrator walking in like, I can't believe you put him in the front of the class and embarrassed him and made him feel so bad. And I'm like, oh man, you just ruined everything <laughs> because they're just like, you have to stop doing that. I'm like, no, I ain't going to do that. So, and luckily I am in the I'm in the position now of being tenured, which again, ironically enough, I'm not really for tenure, but since I have it, I'm sure I, I'm definitely going to you know, wield it because this is it's probably for this exact purpose. When an administrator comes in and wants to destroy everything you're working for in your classroom. And I, I tell my administrators every, every district and every campus that I've been on, I'm like, look, I have a reverent respect for the chain of command and authority. It's very important to me. And whatever you, whatever direction you want to take this school in and whatever whatever your vision for your campus is, I will follow through on that, provided that whatever you recommend does not undermine my authority in the room because I must have order and structure in my classroom. And if whatever you're recommending to me undermines my authority, I'm sorry, that's where the line is drawn. And it really would surprise me if you don't find comfort in what I'm saying right now. Like if I was at if I was a principal, I would want I would want the relief of knowing that my faculty demands order and structure in their room, not in a hostile authoritarian way, you know, where you're deliberately going out and trying to ridicule students or do something like that. It's not ridicule for me to bring a student up in front of the room and let them get a little taste of what it's like to have everyone looking at you and expecting 
to expecting for you to you know have a product or have something have progress in your class by the end of the day and realizing that joking around is going to get you about 10 to 15 seconds you know of time which is i mean any teacher you know would know that joking around is something that's appropriate once in a while you know because you can only you can only carry yourself for so long eventually you know a classroom will deteriorate into chaos and madness in a matter of one to two minutes something that you might not be able to recover from for weeks maybe even longer yeah i hope i answered your question <laughs> sorry yeah, absolutely yeah. well i'm wondering um i'm wondering several things um <laughs> i do think it's neat that you have tenure so you don't have to worry about being fired i've never had that experience so i was always just stressed out and terrified like all the time but i'm wondering yeah. How are the other teachers getting along in your building? Do you hear from them that they're experiencing a lot of disrespect or have some of the hippie teachers been able to kind of make the kumbaya classroom management work for them? Well, that is a tough question to answer because I am I am pretty old school conservative. There are a couple teachers on my campus that are like me. How do, how do I get along with the other teachers? Uh, well, I was wondering how the students treat them. Do they, do they make that classroom management style work? work for them and do the students get along with them and do they get things done or do you does it seem like a lot of classrooms are kind of out of control at this point what do you think yeah my 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 initial response would be no chance <laughs> there's no way that they're having their classes under control you might have your hippie teachers that are you know surviving it and saying that things are working when it's when it's not you know and they're just kind of accepting this as the quote unquote new normal or the new way of doing things when i have walked through campus for whatever reason i might have to have been walking somewhere and i i peek into other rooms yeah they're not under control at all you got students who are sitting on desks with their hoods over their heads you know clustered in a corner the teachers in the front trying to teach and you know you have other students on the other side of the room maybe throwing things across the room and stuff and they're just like well you know this is just how things are done now now. And I'm like, no, that's not how things are done. That's never, it's never been that way. The other teachers that I do get along with well complain equally as much as I do. Um, and I guess complain is the wrong word. They're, they're echoing the same, you know, the same sentiment that I have. I, I am the only teacher that I am aware of on my faculty who is going directly to administration often and going and covering these issues. All the other teachers, I would guess, are, like you said, too afraid to bring it up or they don't want to put the target on their back and make their lives more miserable. Because even if you do have tenure, they will do whatever they can to make your life miserable if you go against the flow. You know, I was even asked by my administration, like, well, Peterson, uh, why are you the only one who's coming in here and complaining about these things? And I said, well, because it appears I'm the only member of your faculty foolish enough to engage in this exercise of futility, <laughs> you know, because, which of course they didn't take very well, but it's absolutely true. I said, and I told them, I said, you're not, why would they come in here? You're obviously not supporting us. So why would they, why would they bother with the effort? So to answer your question, the other teachers, I cannot imagine that they're getting by well. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they're doing what all other teachers in public school are doing right now, which is start the first day of school and come hell or high water pray and hope every day that you make it until summer mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. hope and hope that your entire summer you're not you know, dreading every day for that next first day of school to start which most mm -hmm. of the time when you're on vacation now which you know, at least with me when i'm on vacation it's not really like vacation because you're just wigging out and stressed the whole time you know, either with what you went through the previous year or worried about what's coming up next year yeah i can i can relate to a lot of what you're saying because I kind of feel as if I'm sort of traditional and old school. I don't think by any stretch of the imagination that I'm like scary, but I just couldn't actually like I have a really low threshold for complete chaos. And so I was told all the time that my classroom management was amazing. But I think what people don't realize is the amount of like stress and effort and just like how draining that is. So it feels to me like trying to like hold beach balls under the water all over the place or trying to like, you know, take a barrel of cats in a wheelbarrow across the county. It just, it's so much work. And so how has that affected you just in your personal life? And I went over this with my administration. I'm like, look, I was up last night again until 3 a.m. This is like the fourth or fifth consecutive night. 
and they're like <laughs> this particular administrator of mine just had the had the audacity and gall to say to me like how are you letting that affect you at home you're taking that home with you you're letting these students affect you like that i'm like no i'm letting you affect me like that you're the one <laughs> you are the reason why that's happening and they're, they're trying to they're constantly trying to turn it around on you it just compounds the issue because yeah it, you go home it affects the way that you treat your family it affects all the stuff that you would do in a normal life and yeah i'm I'm simply not tolerating anymore. That's why I've reached the point of complete and utter resignation. And I'm sure most teachers are already there. They might be compensating with, um, you know, maybe, or I should say overcompensating with trying to make things positive or trying to make things look like they're happier than they are. And that'll, that'll carry you for only a short amount of time. Eventually, you know, it will come out. You know, there, there will be chinks in your armor that will, you know, and it's going to take the form, maybe losing control in your class, you know, losing your temper or, you know, I mean, thank God I've never never been reduced to the point where I'm crying in my car or something like that, but I know it happens all over the place. I know that you can walk into a room and you'll see some teacher just breaking down in the corner on their prep period. And uh, you ha you have to guard your sanity in your life. If I had to give advice to teachers, I would say, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry for this being the answer, but you have to give up. You just have to resign. That's not, and I don't mean resign as in like quit teaching. I mean, mentally resign from your class and from that stress don't let administrators you know use you as the buffer zone between their experiment where they're trying to do this you know this kumbaya nonsense where they, they take a student into their room and they give them you know they give them a bag of chips and a capri sun you know and send them back to class and eventually six months to a year later through some kind of ridiculous lofty psychological you know uh, philosophical discussion or whatnot they're going to finally get the kid to realize is that they want to follow the rules and yet in, in the meantime you're just going through this hell hole in your in your like no don't do that to yourself <laughs> don't do that to yourself why would you ever run that kind of interference on your own life and your own career yeah i i think that that's the the thing that a lot of teachers cannot express because there's so much toxic positivity and especially during, you know, the pandemic and trying to teach from home and just, or teaching in the building that's like empty and just all the nonsense. I just remember there was like such a push to, it's just like this fake pretending where teachers would be like, oh, I'm so broken hearted for my babies. I just know they're <laughs> struggling so hard and it just hurts so much. And I just wanted to be like, quit lying. Uh-huh, amen. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Yeah. It's and I cringe. Know it, sounds, it sounds hard, but it's just like the thing is, I feel like most adults' lives were like falling apart at that point and we were struggling and they were just adding so much onto our plate. And I just think weird psychological dynamics start to happen. My favorite analogy is it's kind of like we're all in prison and the security guards are the admin. And we're trying to get in good with the security guard so that maybe they'll give us extra breadcrumbs in our salad or something like Amen. that, you know, Amen. and it's really hard because then teachers kind of feel like they need to kind of turn on each other mm -hmm. or they start one upping each other, or there's just a lot of tension and all these problems with the adults. And because there's this big surface level game, I think for a lot of teachers, it feels unsafe to literally come out and just say like, I feel like I'm drowning. I'm hurting. I'm struggling. I'm angry. It's just like none of that can really come out. You just have to keep stuffing it and bottling it. And I do feel like there's always like a few teachers that would try to speak up and say things. But like you mentioned earlier, they were kind of like hated by admin. And so it's just like there's so many games that get played and it's just so exhausting. And so how do you feel that the teachers, it's, it's still fascinating to me that you're popular with the students, even though, you know, you keep a lot of authority and you're not trying to like butter up to them so you just kind of have to help me understand like what those dynamics are like do they follow your directions do they listen to you do they do your work like how does all of that shake out yeah so i guess i would say the main the main difference between me and all the other teachers is i get a lot of stuff done and the students appreciate that you know like um even the students that want to screw around will 
ultimately figure out that, okay, this is my class inherently is, is a fun subject, I guess you would say. And so, but it's very difficult. It's a very difficult class. And so we get a lot of stuff done and I demand that kind of progress. And the only way that I pull that off is by defying the directions from the administration who want me to take the kind of soft hand kumbaya nonsense. The way that I have to get all that stuff done basically is by just not caring and giving up, <laughs> you know, on uh, you know, like, oh, how do I explain this? So, okay, so if I could touch on what you were mentioning earlier about all the stuff that's being piled on teachers and all the things that they want us to do, and it, it really is inappropriate, the things that they, the, the roles that they want us to take, like they, they want us to take the role of a parent and the role of a psychologist, you know, and the role of a referee and all this other stuff. And I just straight up tell people, like, no, it's not my job. I'm not doing that. It's not my job. I'm not going to counsel this child as if I'm their parent, I, you know, I'll counsel them on, on how to, how to take the role of a student in my class. You know, I'll counsel them on the subject matter, but I'm not getting into their personal life. And people say, well, then how do you build relationships that way? And I'm like, you, you build the relationship by getting them better at the subject. That's what makes them, that's what they get excited about. They get excited about having knowledge and having control over something in their life. And I, and I'm not positive. This is why, why I ended up being, you know, more, you know, one of the popular, I mean, I got to the point where I, I actually became teacher of the year, you know, district wide in my district. And it wow. was, it was shocking to me. I couldn't believe it. Like I, I almost didn't go to that end of the year meeting because I didn't want to be there. And like, just out of the blue, they named, they, you know, they brought up my name. And so I don't even know the measures that they, that they took. You know, I don't know how they decided it was me, if it was a student vote or teacher vote or whatever, but that would be my guess is that I, I just, I, I stay strict to the book and I, you know, it's, it's kind of a selfish reason too. I don't feel like being in the same place in January that I was in August. Like it's, it's not even really because of my concern for the students, why we have progress every day. It's, it's me, it's my sanity. Like I don't want to be talking about the same stuff or going over the same things months later. Cause then I would have said, well, what, why didn't we just sit here and twiddle our thumbs until February and then started in February if we, if we were just going to be in the same place that we were in September. So if another, another philosophy that tends to be in the school, that I disagree with is you're taught even in the credential program that if you want anything done or if you want any if, if you want any concessions made for you or whatever right frame everything toward the students everything is about the students so if you go to the administrator and you need something in your class you know frame it in a, in a way that has to do toward the students and it's always students first students first students first which in a sense is true but my own allegiance is always to the parents first so when I'm whenever I'm making choices and decisions it's the parents desires in mind that i have to fulfill first and then the administrator and then you know the school board policy and whatnot and then students last because i i i don't base my decisions off of students desires because the students literally don't have the agency yet to understand what's good enough for them i'm at least going to bank or i'm going to i'm going to bet that the parents do the parents do know what there is good for their own child and so if i was a principal and i was hiring teachers i would want to hear a teacher say that i my plan in the classroom is to be a model for the students to benefit the parents because that's what a parent really wants when they send their child to school what they really want is not that the child can you know remember a bunch of dates you know in history or you know be able to you know identify nouns and verbs and stuff i mean of course they're going to want that you know for their child at a you know at a certain point at a certain level if they're going to an english class they're going to want them to do something with english when the class is over but what a parent really wants in the front of the room is a model they want their student coming home and modeling whatever that person was doing in the class they want someone who can you know show how to resolve conflicts they want someone who has kind of a, a daily courtesy and manners and all of these other things. And that's what my allegiance is. I'm trying to demonstrate to the students every day what being an adult looks like and how you how you survive and navigate through a harsh <laughs> and complicated world. And so um, I think the students, in a sense, understand that when they look at me and they see how I conduct myself, and that's probably what they appreciate. And as opposed to a teacher who's basically their quote-unquote friend, and they're not really getting a model of what 
what being an adult looks like. Excellent. What would you say is your biggest day-to-day -day problem related to students? Discipline. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just... Uh, the, the students are getting to the point where they think they're, they're not getting to the point. They do think they're on the same level as the teacher. They do think that they have the authority to just say what they want the moment it comes to their mind or waltz in whenever they feel like it and showboat over to their seat. For example, there was one kid that I was, I was on my prep period walking to the office and he's in the, you know, the bathrooms on our campus. It's, it's an outside bathroom and there's kind of like a little hallway corridor area before you actually enter the door. So he's hiding in that little, you know, that little corridor area, screwing around, throwing things, kicking the door, whatever, right? And so I get one of the campus security and I say, hey, he's got to go to the office. You know, he's supposed to be in class. He's just doing whatever he's doing there. It's not good, <laughs> right? So, um, and this kid knows me. He's like yeah, a constant problem. He was in my class before I got him taken out, you know, yada, yada, yada. And all the way from that bathroom to the office, his head was turned around backwards with this sinister grin on his face as if he knew without doubt when he reached the office, there was nothing waiting for him. Mm. Nothing. <laughs> and so it's, it's this mockery that you deal with on campus where you have these students that not only think they're at your level, but above your level. Like they have this look on their face like this is an adorable little game that you're about to play with me. And, you know, you just got me, I was trying to get out of class and now I'm really out of class. And, you know, just go ahead and try this with me again kind of a thing. Another example, this one girl in my class, constant problem, you know, same thing, walking in whenever she feels like it, talking back, you know, not participating, disruptive, you name it, right? So this one particular day, she just walks out of class whenever she feels like it. And so... Uh, I call the office. I let them know. I say, hey, so-and-so is out on the run. I don't know what she left. Didn't give a reason. Yada, yada, yada. They go find her. Nothing happens, right? I never hear anything. So the next day I'm walking around during lunch and I see her and I walk up to her and I say, hey, I'm going to need an explanation for why you left my class yesterday without permission. Now, and this is a little 90 pound, 12 year old girl soaking wet. You know what I mean? Like, and I know you guys out there can't see me right now, but you know, I'm a 6'1", you know, 220 martial artist, you know, like I'm in my early forties, you know, I'm not in peak physical condition, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty well built. I'm stacked, you know, and like this girl looks at me and she's all, y'all better back up, like getting in my face, like about to fight me. And it's just so bizarre. It's so insane that this person thinks under any other circumstance, if you were to do that, it would be, it would end very, very badly for you. <laughs> like, I just couldn't believe it. And I was just thinking to myself, what on earth would make you think that was a good idea? Like if we weren't in school, everyone seems to be in this fantasy land where you can just speak to anyone however you please. And like, just not being aware that you know, in the real world, if, if I were to have done someone said something to, like that to somebody, especially if I, it never would have crossed my mind at age 12 to say something to a fully grown man like that. And so, you know, of course I, I bring him to the office. Oh God, I bring him to the office. I'm, I'm sitting in there with her and the principal and the principal's doing this super cringy, like, oh, you go girl. Like, this, and like it was insane. <laughs> it was like, I couldn't believe it. Like he was, he's doing this whole soup, like super goofy, like cr cringy, trying to, trying to get under a level talk like her kind of thing i'm just like oh my god don't ever do that again man don't ever do that if i bring a student in here to go over what went like to go over like all the stuff that we not only just in class but what just happened out there like what are you thinking what are you thinking <laughs> like wow. yeah That's it's uh-huh uh-huh yeah thank god someone else thinks the same because i just yeah like that's that's the level. I mean, when I'm in these meetings with administration in the office, like sometimes they say things to me that are so outrageous. I'm just actually stunned for a couple seconds. Like I'm I, I'm just sitting there listening to them, looking at what I thought was a fully functioning educated adult, and I'm just like, how on earth could you think that was a good idea? Or like, could you just say something so so bass backwards? And well, the oh. crazy part too is that it. I would constantly like have this running conversation with myself. It's like, do they have some kind of weird Stockholm syndrome to their own ideology where they've convinced themselves of this? Or do they know that this stuff is ridiculous and doesn't work? And they're just glad they're not the ones in the classroom teaching anymore. Because yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, no. I just genuinely wondered because I'm like, it's so common sense that, you know, doing these weird, like, here, I'm going to give you a think sheet after.
after you just cussed out the teacher and that's going to fix it. Like, it's so obvious that that doesn't work. And especially at some of these out of control schools, yet they still keep hiring these companies to come in and do professional developments and come meet with us at meetings. And I'm just thinking, I, I sincerely wonder, do these people really believe this? The irony is that some of them, I would catch a student being disrespectful. I didn't feel like they handled it all hippie like. I felt like they kind of uh-huh. like were intimidating and kind of was like oh, yeah. like that. And so I'm like, okay, so you know that it doesn't work. Yet you're telling me I need to do this. In yep. no way would you tolerate this kind of disrespect, which is why you've removed yourself from the classroom by getting like an admin or a consultant job. But I almost don't know how people can live with themselves, just really just making everybody's life a nightmare. I just, I don't understand it. <laughs> so. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up because in the near future, I'm going to be bringing up this exact topic with one of them and being like, look, can you just please get you whichever gaslighting story straight? Like just pick which, pick which one you want to stick with because they give you this whole nonsense about well, there's a better way, Mr. Peterson, and this is yada, yada, yada. But then they also say like 30 seconds later, they're like, look, our hands are tied. We can't, it's it's the current year and we can't do the stuff like that we used to do back when we were, you know, I'm like, okay, well, which one do you want then? Because you're saying, are, are you telling me that you want to punish and you want to have punitive elements to your discipline and we can't anymore because the quote unquote laws have changed, which they haven't, but the quote unquote laws have changed or is there a better way? And if there is a better way, can you please point me in the direction or show me the evidence in which and <laughs> how your school is getting better? Because by all accounts and all measures that I've seen since the beginning of the year, it has, has not gotten better at all and it's gotten way worse. And yes, I have actually taken my own personal reconnaissance survey with the rest of your faculty on my own time, you know, the buzz around the staff room and stuff. And unanimously, every single one of those teachers say the same students that keep getting passed around like the like the campus headache from class to class are the same students that are causing them problems now. So I, we would be most appreciative if you would pick which nonsense story you're going to keep giving us. <laughs> Absolutely. So do you guys have any kind of like ISS or detention or like nope. what happens basically nope. when it acts up? Uh, they go to the office and they fill out a reflection form and they talk about their choices and their feelings and they do some kind of behavior contract, which means nothing. <laughs> you know, it's I mean, and they don't even, even when we do send them to the office and they do all of these ineffective measures, they don't send us any information on what happened unless I, like an annoying, you know, like, like the annoying little you know, thorn in their side keeps sending them a message and say, hey, are you going to let me know what's happened? Because I'm going to see this kid again tomorrow and I'm going to kind of want to know. And they're like, oh, okay, fine. <laughs> you know, and they're like, type it back and they're all, you know, you know, I spoke to the student. Oh yeah. But one, but the discipline officer of my High school his his approach is taking them to the gym and working out that's hmm. that's their punishment you know taking the jock to the gym and working out so <laughs> they can have a good old buddy buddy session and he can build a relationship with them that obviously isn't there because if it was there the kid wouldn't be turning around with his head backwards and a sinister grin on his face staring at me all the way to the office he's putting on a show for you and you're either too foolish to see it or you're too you're too weak to to really accept that you're just going to, and really why would they? I mean, most, in most cases, all the teachers are going to outlive these administrators. You know, on my campus, there's been a new principal. I think I, I've only been on this campus for one year, but all the other teachers say in the last eight years, there's been seven principals. So I think everyone just kind of knows that they're only there for a year. And that might be another reason why teachers aren't bothering to go in there and talk talk to the administration about this stuff. And how could you ever possibly expect to have some kind of continuity and leadership and really any established order on campus when you have that kind of turnover. It's just not possible. It's it's yeah, never going to happen. Yeah, that's been my experience too with just like really high admin turnover. And the thing that would frustrate me so much is that they would do things like you're saying, you know, kind of pretend to be their friend and sympathize with them and not tell them anything that they're doing wrong and then be like, oh, we're best friends. Why don't they like you? And I'm like, I guarantee yep. you, if 
through the teacher, giving out homework, giving out assignments, telling them to sit down, telling them to stop talking out of turn, asking them why they're late, redirecting them, then they would dislike you as much as they dislike the teachers. But it's just, again, such a fantasy. It's like, it's this whole thing where we're just constantly trying to, like, like you said, gaslight teachers into being responsible for every single student liking them when these students' values are like on a different planet altogether. It's like, maybe if all I did all day was like, you know, play YouTube videos and give them candy and like, you know, hold their hand, maybe they would like me a little bit better. <laughs> but that's mm. not in sync with the values and the outcomes that you're saying you want, which is that they have these really high test scores and that they can actually do work. And so it's like, it would always be so frustrating to me because it's like they're giving us two completely conflicting goals. They're saying they want the students to love us and for us to be like best friends and family and for everybody to have loads of fun. But they're also saying, you know, they want a really controlled classroom environment, good classroom management, and they want these students to be growing by one or two and a half years because a lot of the students I've had were years behind anyway. And mm -hmm. so it's just like all of these goals are conflicting. And it's like either you are going to give me the authority to do what it takes to get these students, you know, at least on grade level or beyond, or we're going to do things your way and see what the results are. And I always kind of have likened it to it's kind of like you give a surgeon sandbag sandbox, you know, play tools to do their mm -hmm. surgery and then say, oh, why is your surgery un successful. It's like, well, you took away <laughs> all of my tools and you gave me plastic ones. You told me to operate. Like that's why this surgery was not successful. And I just think that that is totally what's happening in education right now. All these tried and true tools that have worked for all of these years are being taken away. And we're given all of these literal joke, you know, preschool sandbox tools that don't work. And they're like, why are kids so far behind? Yeah. Why are they misbehaving? Why do we have all the crime that we have? And so I guess the question that I would ask you is what do you think it would take to really turn things around and make things great again? <laughs> Responding first to what you said, it, it is a classic pass the buck 101 scenario. Like the, the, the administrators are more than happy to put that pressure on the teachers because the teacher is the one actually with the legal responsibility with the kids in the room. And so the, the administrator is going to do whatever they can to push all of that Ill, illegitimate pressure on us because we're supposed to be teaching the content. We're supposed to be establishing rules in our classroom, but it's not our job to correct the students really when they break those rules. It's the job of the administrator to administer the policy. Like you know, the name of the, you know, the purpose of your job is in the name of your title kind of a thing that you are where the buck stops. You're supposed to be the referee and enforce the rules that we establish in class. And we can, we have, we have minor measures that we can do on the spot in the class in an emergency to correct a student. But if they're, if they're, you know, consistently defying our rules, that's now out of our realm. And they're trying to put that in our realm, just like you said, you know, we, you know, that's the time when you need actual services surgical equipment and we don't have it and we don't want it and we're not supposed to have it you know we're supposed to be we have we perform a different function on campus now as far as fixing it first and foremost absolutely you have to in bring back the element of punitive measures when students break the rules and why oh i don't know maybe because every single other industry and facet in life has the exact same format like when you get pulled over by a cop for running a stop sign are they going to have you fill out a reflection form right are they going to are they going to talk to you about your feelings and go into the the deep annals of your history and everything else about your life and try to connect and build a relationship with you no <laughs> Even if they want to, they don't have the time. Yeah. It's just not practical. Yeah, absolutely. First and foremost, that has to be brought back. And I'm so sorry to say this, but really my advice to teachers is just get out. Just get out. <laughs> like, there, there, it's really, this could be an entire separate video of the 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 problems with public education, even from its inception. It just, it, it doesn't work. I tell people all the time, my my children are homeschooled. I'm, I, you know, I got teachers asking me all the time, well, when are your kids going to be here? And I'm like, never, <laughs> never, 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 never. Like I tell people all the time, public school is by far 
one of the most poisonous influences on a child. Not only because of the other students that they're going to be surrounded by for 12, 13 straight years that you don't have any control over as a parent. And then, of course, you have your problems with the administration, which goes all the way up to district leadership and then, you know, your state capital and all of the geniuses up there who think because they sign some document, they're going to make all, you know, they're going to change their state for the better. And nope, it's not going to happen. So my advice to teachers is get out. Just get out. Please don't put yourself through this. Now, another, another thing I was thinking, oh, I'm sorry, ask me your question again, because now I don't remember what I was going, what I was going with that. Oh, yeah. I was just wondering what you thought it would take to change how things are, if, if, if it's even possible at this point. That's the major one, is having actual functional order on your campus with, you know, punishment. And, and people are always, you know, some administrator is soiling their, themselves right now when I say that, because the, the the moment you say punitive or punishment, they're like, oh my gosh, you know, and they're like, they're trying to, oh, okay, so, so here's another example. So administrators, they, they just love to gratify themselves when they say that they're, um, that, that they looked at the quote unquote research, which is always some unnamed research that says, you know, we've, we now have learned, you know, we're, we're, uh, we've evolved and, you know, we're sanctimonious now because we've now have learned that, you know, punishment doesn't work. And all these punitive measures that were done for so many years before, they don't work. And I even told one of my administrators, I said, look, you do understand, right, that we, the teachers, we don't care at all. Even if the research is true, we don't care. When it comes to disciplinary matters, the one and only thing that we care about is how we're being treated by the student body as a whole on campus. And and when I say me, I'm talking about me and all of the other students in the room who are following the rules. That is the only thing that we care about. And what I'm not teaching, you know, in my own life, my own actual personal life, I, I have taken on many endeavors, you know, in the entrepreneurial realm. And I've been, you know, I've been a leader of many projects, you know, the, the quote unquote, the boss, you know, and whenever I have to make a decision that's going to impact everyone who's working for me, even if the decision I'm making is the, the quote unquote right thing to do, one big part, one big piece of the puzzle that I consider is, hmm, is this decision I'm about to make going to, oh, I don't know, piss off everyone who works for me? <laughs> like, that's one thing that I'm planning on asking my administrators in the near future. Like, is this something you guys ever actually consider? Like, are you actually going to really irritate everyone who works for you, everyone that you need to get them to follow your instructions? Like, why would you ever run that kind of interference on yourself? Why would you do that to yourself? So would they, they try to do this, you know, this, um, this stonewall or kind of a strong arm method of saying, well, research says yada, yada, yada. And like, Finally, I'm just going to get all the teachers somehow to say, um, yeah, we don't care. <laughs> like you need to actually be, be a man, you know, and support your team and actually follow through with the stuff that you say you're going to do. And I'm saying, be a man as you know, if your principal's a man, of course, you know, <laughs> you, can, you can say it however you want, if your principal's a woman, but yeah, I think you guys all get the gist of what I'm saying here. Like it, it can't work. It's, it's, it's as absurd as being a, a business owner and hiring a manager that makes decisions that makes all of your employees boys quit. Mm -hmm. like, why, why would you do that to your own business? <laughs> so, and, and everyone intuitively understands that. Yeah, it's sad that it's like the administration is not always accountable. And so, like you said, they just keep passing the blame off onto the teachers. And then they just kind of keep shuffling administrators. And I have had a few that I think that they knew that the system was wrong and they tried to push back, but then they knew that that was their job that was going to be lost. And it's, it almost seems like an education. Everybody is afraid of somebody else. It's like, you know, the principals are afraid of central office and, you know, central office is afraid of the superintendent and the superintendent mm -hmm. is afraid of the state. And it's just this kind of just awful system where yeah, it can't I work. I was going to say it can't work. And you are also correct about the private school system, how that that's not the solution is just to go over to the private school, which the private school in essence is supposed to be the solution, but the private school is basically just a public school that people pay for. You know, they, st they're, they're, they still have to obey the whims of the state and all that other stuff. And then, you know, you are going to have, unfortunately, the element of 
you know, high paying customers that are going to do They're going to try to throw their weight around and their influence. And I don't, I, I've never been in a private school, so I don't really know how I would deal with that. But I teach privately, but that's because it's my own business. And I've never had yet, you know, a, a high paying customer come in there and try to throw their weight around. And I don't know what I would do. The public school system definitely, definitely is a broken system. And there's there's no way to maintain your sanity and obey all of the ridiculous edicts that come from every direction. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And that's what I think made me feel so guilty is because there's a part of me that really does want to, you know, quote unquote, obey my own authority. So it's like I hated feeling like I literally can't do, you know, 70 percent of this nonsense. Like I can't even function or stay above water while doing all of these crazy initiatives and steps and like random things they would throw on us. And so it was just everything I could do to do my best and to try to like help my students the best that I could. But I hated feeling like I had to pretend that I was doing all of these random things that there was just no way that I was going to be able to do. <laughs> yeah, like for example, like just to give everyone a little taste of the outrageous requirements and the only reason why my class i think had the success that it, that it does is because i would defy these these absurd i want to call them recommendations but they're not they're edicts but okay so for, for those who don't know there was a thing called bloom's taxonomy and bloom's taxonomy is like a pyramid that you know it's i, I can't remember all of it now but it starts with like you know memorization and then like the next level up is you know uh recognition and the next level up is something like i don't know analysis and the next level up is like critique and the highest level is creation or whatever right it's, the higher you go up the harder it is and so they're trying to say well just focus on those high levels you know and the students will they'll they'll you know they'll ascend up to it just because that's what you're always talking about and so they you know in a science class for example they'd say well you know get to the point where they can start you know creating their own mechanical objects and blah 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 and things and i'm like okay these kids don't know what fractions are yet <laughs> like okay are you kidding me like how on earth are we, let's let's yeah let's let's bridge this chasm right now right now with you and me talking and you explain to me how on earth are we going to get to the point where they can critique you know if i if i give them a problem or something and they can tell me how you know how they would navigate through this issue oh and by the way they don't know fractions or long division or like all of these bare minimum requirements to even get started and everyone is going to you know soil themselves if you mention that you know you're going to need some rote learning for a while they're like oh no that's that's bottom level stuff and i'm like yeah that's what they need they need the rote learning they need the repetition over and over and over again just like the rest of us did when we were all in school and that's why we can all do it because you need to be able to activate instantly these answers before you start dealing with this high level complexity and all of the sophisticated stuff and so you know a, a brilliant administrator is just going to keep going to these stupid conferences that they go to in the summertime and then they bring back all that knowledge because some other you know some other blowhard on the other side of the country says that they did this and it had magnificent results for their district which is total nonsense i'm calling receipts you know and I, like and the next time they oh man i'm sorry i'm going in so many directions here but the next time i'm with an administrator and they try to pull this but research shows nonsense with me I, i'm going to say this exact thing to them i'm like look you and i right now need to call that school and speak to a handful of those teachers on the phone right now on speakerphone and i want to hear from them because one of the oh god okay another story so this a couple weeks ago we had a meeting where a guy was doing the whole you know kumbaya discipline stuff saying how with uh what do they call it it's called um restorative justice and all that stuff with um the discipline yeah blah 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 okay so he was saying how 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 well it worked in all of these different cities one of which he brought up was oakland and i know for sure <laughs> oakland is a war zone it's a disaster <laughs> and i'm like i right there in that meeting i just want to say i want to call that district right now get them on the phone and i want to talk to those teachers because i know without doubt it would be a different story so what are your plans going forward in education Education. Are you going to try to squeeze out like retirement? Are you trying to find your exit strategy? What are you thinking now? Exit strategy. I've been playing my exit strategy for years and little by little, I'm, I'm working on stuff to finally say goodbye. And um, yeah, there's no, there's no way, no way I'm sticking this out. 
for retirement. This, if I tried that, this, this career would be the source of my heart attack, mm -hmm. no doubt. And, um, if I can work it out by this summer where I'm out then hallelujah, but may, I'm sure I'm going to be stuck here for another year or two. I kind of get a plan every couple years, you know, that seems like it's going to work out. And then I'm, you know, I'm not jumping into anything precipitously where I'm, you know, I'm full. Of, you, know, you do get, you do watch videos online, you know, with other teachers who say, you know, just be careful before you exit, because I, I'm assuming most teachers are thorough enough to know that you can't just jump into a whole new career and expect to have the same kind of success or, it, you know, we're, we're not naive to know that it takes a couple of years, you know, before you can really support yourself. And again, I live kind of an old school, you know, conservative lifestyle. My wife stays at home, which is what we both enjoy, you know, and I, I, I'd like to keep it that way. I don't want to have my kids. I don't want to be worried about how the kids are being raised, you know, with both of us working. If it came down to that, she would be willing to do so, you know, if I, if I absolutely had to leave, if I had been completely fed up. Yeah, I, might, I, I hope to leave as soon, as soon as possible. And so what advice would you give to a teacher that is in your position that is just completely burnt out, is just really struggling to make it through the day? What kind of advice would you give them if they feel like they still need to squeeze out another one or two years in the classroom? Mentally resign. As I said, ironically enough, the students, at least for me, figured out that when I wasn't trying to, you know, turn everything into a hokey pokey positive environment. I don't know how, I, I can't really explain it, but it ended up where they just enjoyed themselves more. They enjoyed the structure. They enjoy the more the more direct and dry approach to things because, you know, kids aren't dumb. You know, they know when their time is being wasted and they, they know when, you know, they, they intuitively feel when progress is being made. And I don't really know if it's going to work for everybody, but that's what it worked for me. I, I, <laughs> is it, has anyone here seen the, the TV show AP? bio have you seen that show no so it's it's a comedy and it's it's a you know it's exaggerated of course but it's basically about a teacher who resents everything about his job and just hates it and you know kind of became the teacher that everyone liked and i mean he's he's totally outrageous in the show but i'm pretty much him <laughs> you know i walk in the class and then uh, I, I kind of go out of my way not to really know anything about my students' lives. And I don't know, they really, they kind of like it. And But again, it's not because I have some kind of 4D chess plan of you know, turning my class into some showstopper or something. It's its just, it's self-preservation. I'm, I'm not putting myself to that stress ever again in my life. I basically have, you know, given up and quiet quit it on my own. And um, I'm i am getting through each, each day and each week, bare absolute minimum as, as possible. Another funny story is, uh, you know, my computer for whatever reason wasn't interfacing with the, you know, with the projector or something. So the IT guy's in there, you know, and he's like trying to figure it out. He's like, He's like, well, when, when you take your computer home and you're doing work at home, are you doing this on your home network and stuff? And I'm like, well, I don't really mean anything insulting by this man, but at 320, I don't come anywhere near that computer <laughs> until the next day. That computer is far, far away from me. It doesn't go up to my house. It stays right there. You know, and he's like, okay, I get it. <laughs> so I, I'm sorry. I am the I am the epitome of the teacher who has literally just, is just fed up, given up, comes in at you know, eight in the morning, leaves exactly at 320. And then it might as well be a rocket on the back of my truck, you know, in that parking lot. I'm gone and I'm never coming back until that next day. And there's absolutely no interaction from me at all, which in some ways is a little sad. You know, I, I, I would, when I was a first, first year teacher, you know, I was much more involved. Yeah, you got to do what you got to do to stay alive. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm just curious, and this will probably be one of my last questions, because I'm sure a lot of teachers are like, how are you able to do that? Do you have to do detailed lesson plans? Do you have a lot of grading? You know, like, what about like all the kind of paperwork and nonsense? Like, how is your district on that? Or how are you able to completely leave school behind and get all of your little like, you know, T's crossed? Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, well, I have one prep period and that's when I do everything. And if it doesn't get done, it doesn't get done. Too bad, so sad. Sorry, not sorry. And so, yeah, I mean, like things that I would have, you know, activities and projects that I would have had in years past that would have needed to have been graded and monitored and stuff. Nope, it's not happening now. My prep period is well, like most teachers. It's about, I think, 40, 50 minutes or something. And maybe about half of that time is used for, you know, maybe contacting parents or, um, you know, kind of housekeeping items, you know, planning whatever I'm doing. And then the other half is correcting or whatever, you know, and that's what happens each day. And so I'll, 
I'll temper whatever projects or assignments that I have so that they can get done. And I'm sorry, that's about all I can offer when it comes to that. Yeah, you, the the relief and freedom that a teacher will feel by keeping everything on the clock. I mean, that's just the way you got to do it. Do you have admin that drops in a lot to observe you or do they kind of just leave you alone? At the <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> yeah, they leave me pretty much alone because uh, I'll ask them all kinds of uncomfortable questions. And I think they know that. In the last couple of years, yeah, they would get to, to a micromanaging level, but I was still kind of in my, you know, timid follow, you know, follow what's, you know, what follow the plan kind of state. And so, yeah. Well, this has been a really interesting conversation. <laughs> I appreciate your honesty because I think that whenever I'm making videos, I kind of have on three hats. I'm thinking this is what teachers will hear when they're hearing me talk and they almost unanimously agree. This is what parents that find my channel will think and they're normally like, you're terrible. And so then a random person that's a kid or something that's also like you're terrible so i'm sure a lot of people that are not teachers you know might feel a little uncomfortable with some of the things that we've talked about but the reason i named the channel teacher therapy is the true audience that i'm looking to support are teachers and there's just such a i think it's changing now but at least you know before 2020 i felt like there was almost nothing on the internet that was telling the truth about teaching except for maybe reddit and maybe like a few i quit teaching videos mm -hmm. so i'm really happy to be able to like like provide a platform where teachers can speak the truth. And I'm glad that you're not going to get trouble since we're, you know, keeping your identity anonymous. But I appreciate your honesty in this conversation for sure. Any yeah. final words you want to leave with anybody at all? <laughs> Just thank you. Thank you. This was this was therapeutic and a lot of fun. I hope hope to do it again. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Peterson. We'll catch you next time. Yeah, thank you too. Alrighty. Bye for now. Bye-bye.